So, Miss Ariana, thank you for talking with me. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> well, let's start at the very beginning. Where and when were you born? Okay, so I was born in Brazil, uh, south of Brazil. The name of the state is Paraná, and the city is Curitiba. And I've been born and raised there. Uh, what month and year? Uh, it was December 94, December 4th, uh, 94. So you're a Sagittarius. You like adventure and travel and movement. And yes, <laughs> pretty Sagittarius. My my sign and my rising are Sagittarius. So ah, where's your moon? <laughs> my moon is Capricorn, which brings some balance. <laughs> yes, really nice. Um, yeah. what do you know about the people who were there before your German and Portuguese ancestors came? When when did your were they your grandparents, great grandparents? When did they come to Brazil and why? Yeah, so they were escaping from the war and they were in German. Like my grandma's side, my mom's side, uh, they came on the ship. So my grandma was born in the ship on the way to here. Wow. Uh, her and her sister, they were uh twins but her sister didn't survive so my grandma did and the sister they had to throw the body in the ocean so it was i think it was a hard moment for them like yeah. pretty chaotic yeah so well, that before was that, world war ii yeah and why were they leaving germany because they weren't jewish yeah, they weren't Jewish. I don't know exactly. I think they had like some money. They were not poor. They were medium class. They had a restaurant in German, but I think economics, economic talking, they would like be affected. So they decided to go to a place where they could have better better chances, I guess. That's more or less what I know. I don't know much, much. That's pretty much all I know about it. And what about on your father's side? That who, they came my, from Portugal? Yeah, my father's side is a little like, I keep asking, but they, I don't know, they are not very into their past, I guess. So I know that they have German blood and Portuguese blood. But I had no idea what was going on before they get to Brazil. And I don't even know if my grand, my grandpa is first generation. I don't think he's, he's the first generation in Brazil. Maybe he's the second second generation in Brazil already. So but you're the fourth generation on your father's side. On my father's side, yeah. And on my mom's side, my grandma is the first generation, my mom and her siblings, and then my generation is the third. Yeah. What What do you know about the indigenous people? Like, typically what happens is the European settlers bring diseases, they wipe out the indigenous people, yeah. hardly any remain, people lose history, their culture, what, what do you know about the indigenous people in your state? Yeah, on my state, um, I think it was a pretty, like, similar, but not as wild as up north. But, like, um, I know that my state and all the south of Brazil is pretty heavily colonized by Europeans. You know, but historically, I don't know much like about my state is special. How was it? But I know that South of Brazil is where most like the most the bigger white population is in South. That's why we have like a lot of blonde Brazilians there and like white and like white skin. So it's not only German, there's a lot of Swedish, Swedish, no, Poland, Poland. Italian, yeah, Italians, uh, a lot of European colonization there. In, in, when you were in school, did they 
teached about the history of the indigenous people or not? They did, but in general, like they were colonized by Portuguese, um, uh, Portuguese people. Uh, Pedro Alvarez Cabral is the name of the dude. And that's what happens. Like they, there were indigenous, indigenous people. They bring their culture. They bought them with stupid stuff in like, they started to colonize for real, like, um, getting all the, all the organic material, all the riches from the plate, all the, the minerals, like, gold, minerals, gold, everything started to colonize the culture and it started to repress them. And little by little, the culture was kind of dying and like white men just took over. Did, do you know the names of the, the indigenous people in your state? On oh, my state, because uh, uh, now people will say uh, this is the KCFR radio station and we're on the traditional land of the Machuca people. Yeah, there is like, um, there's a lot of names. The only one that I can remember now is Tupiniki people, which is, I guess is from my state. But it's just something that it's cool. They teach it, but it's n not enough to the student learn, you know, like just pretty basics. And like even in school, I never really get that much. The school never really got my attention. So it's pretty much like 90% that I learned in the school. I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the from... Another direction, new people came to Brazil from Africa. They were brought in to work on the fields and to mine and that kind of thing. Uh, what, what, and so a large percent of Brazilians are people of color because of the Africans, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that happens more. It happens all over the country, but it happens more up north like uh, Bahia, Salvador, all the states up north, that we have a lot of like, I think Brazil is, this, is like the second or the third country with more like a lot of color people. And, but that happens up north because all the ship, shippings, yeah, the big boats, yeah, sure. they, shippings, uh, they stop it up north like on the ocean there so most of the people we stayed on that area for uh being slavery slavers so lots 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 of people that have like we have a lot of african uh, descendants it's up they are up north most of them um you you've told me that you have some friends who practice some of the African traditional religious practices that were brought over. What, yeah. what they they what 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 are examples of those practices that you know of? Well, they do some rituals and they were like they. It's just not about Christ, right? Like there is nothing to do with Christ, and the on that time they needed to like they have. The name that they call for some for some religions, African religions, the goddess they call Orishas, and it's all related with nature. Uh, so like um, back then, back at the time, they they couldn't worship their goddess because the church, Catholic church, would like not allow it. So to them to keep worshiping they, their goddess, they needed to to pretend they were worshiping the saints from the church. So like a lot of um a lot of their goddess, they name it as a saint name to the church thinks that they were worshiping the the gods from the sand from the church, right? But it was actually um, 
a code for them to know what were what were they really worshiping. So that's something like um, there's one one Orisha that is um, if I was on this religion, what was her name? Nana? No, I forgot her name. But like the name of this Orisha is Santa Barbara, for example. So each Orisha has a same name for they don't get caught and be like uh, a problem, right? So, and they brought their own healing practices and rituals. Do you, have you heard of any of those? Yeah, they do a lot of like they do with the smoke. Uh, I don't know the name in English, but like Is with the smoke. Smudging? Yeah, Instead? like sac sacred plants. They do like uh, baths of smoking to clean energies. They do baths, baths with like sacred plants every every disease they have something to heal so they really get like um into nature and they also do like uh, incorporation um or not just incorporation but uh, um how do you call when you receive uh, another conscious that is not you mediumship uh, channeling and channeling, channeling. yeah yeah, some people just channeling, so they have, um, and they have a lot of uh, drums uh, on their culture, so it's pretty, like, maybe I'm not saying that right, because I'm not 100% familiar with that, but I know that they worship um, spirits of nature and spirits of these entities that is not just a person, but it is a conscious, you know? What, so, what about ancestors? A lot of indigenous people really respect the elders that are living and communicate a lot with the ancestors for help and to help them. Yeah. Well, I, for sure, they respect that and they get in touch, but I am not the better, the best person to... Yeah to say for sure but yeah like they have this he not in a bad way of the word but he yeah 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 like they really respected the old ones like the old ones really have uh like they admire these people they respect these people they listen to these people because they know that they they have experienced more than them and they they share wisdom. So they're real, really respected on the environment. Mm -hmm. um, your religious training was totally different. Your, your parents were both Baptists? Yeah, so my parents, they, when I was a little kid, when I born, they were Catholic. Uh -huh. But this kind of Catholic that they just say they're Catholic because they were teached to say that, you know, but they didn't practice it anything. But when I was born, I was, um, how do you say when you were born and they... Baptize you? Yeah, they baptized me in the Catholic church. But I never been, after when I grew a little bit, never been into a Catholic church. But my parents... It was first my dad. My dad converted as a Christian when I was around six years old. And my mom ended up uh, converting also because of my dad, I guess. Like she wasn't, she was doing the thing because of him, but she never really, well, right now she says she's a Christian, but she's not a practice. Uh, pra she doesn't practice much. My dad is still a Christian, and he raised me as a Christian and all this. So, um, I I emailed you that um, some notes on a a Baptist Southern Baptist preacher in the U.S. and I wanted to see. If, 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 if we look over the list, is there, is it all familiar? 
like he says, the Bible should believe li literally. So if it says the world was made in six days, dude, they believe it's it. made in six days. Yeah, that's uh, that was a big point for me when I started to wonder, <laughs> you know, and I started to get older and start to be like, they take it, they take everything literal, literal. So when they say that the world was created in six days, they they believe it. When they say that um, Moses opened the sea and passed through in the middle, they believe it. They believe it like literally what the Bible says. And for me, that was always a big point because on my mind, it was already like probably this is a story, but just like... um. How can I say a myth that we use as humans to tell stories and bring a symbolism from that? And I always had this kind of thing on my mind, but when I started to bring it up, those themes they they were like that's true, and you should believe it. You know, like you shouldn't be thinking about this. You know, so they they completely do believe it is literal. How how old were you when you started questioning? Do you remember? Yeah, I think I was around 13 to 15, 14 maybe. It got like, before I was pretty much following the rules because there was no option, right? And then as this age, 12, um, 13, 14, I started to to question a little more because I remember we had those uh, dominical classes. I don't know how do you call you guys call it, but like on the Baptist uh, tradition in Brazil, at least every Sunday morning they have like a biblical school where yeah. you go to classes with people on your age and you learn about the Bible and stuff. Yeah, we just call it Sunday school. Yeah, Sunday school. So they had this, and it was just people on my age, right? And then start to talk. And I remember it wasn't like most of the time I didn't want to be there, but got in the point that I just accepted, like I had to be here anyway. And it wasn't bad. Like I remember some teachers, they were pretty cool, you know, like and open to open discussions and like talking about it they wanted to list list and what we had to say but the thing was that nobody ever bring like it was pretty hard to someone brings a point like confronting you know so we just have those discuss like we just talk about stuff but always agreeing with what was said never bring a different point of view and I remember that as a teenager, like I was confronting more because all these, I remember that I was pretty into like um, not being um, racist or not being like sexual against like gay people, for example. And I remember that they said, they used to say like, yeah, I have to love uh everyone the way they are but it's not right to be a gay person like we have to have uh to treat we have to treat them well and we have to have uh love for them but it's not right so we have we have to to our paper in this this world is to say about the love of christ and christ doesn't allow women with women and men with men because the pur the purpose of um women and men are to have kids and if you're just having sex with a person of the same sex is not right and then i started to feel like you tell me to love these people but you don't accept them you are trying to change them so how do you love them if you don't accept what they are and then it was pretty confusing in my mind, you know, 
how I'm going to bring a gay friend to here if you guys don't accept this person, you know? So for me, it was pretty confusing. Like, they wanted to love them, but if I have a gay friend and they this person doesn't feel welcome here, so I cannot be her friend anymore. Like, what are you guys talking, you know? So it started like this <laughs> when I started to be like, uh, I don't get it, you know, like, doesn't make much sense for me. And then that must have been confusing because you said that you were attracted to a girl when you were yeah. a teenager. Yeah, and that was pretty traumatic because, like, um, the first person that I discovered that I like this person, right? Not as a friend, not as all my all the other friends that I have. I like this person in a different way. It was a girl, and it was so genuine and so um, it was not sexual it was anything like that it was just how can you say it's not just genuine but innocent it was super innocent I didn't realize it at all that I was liking this person on this way you know so I remember that I brought this girl at home a few times but as a friend like just discovering this new thing excitement you know and I remember one time she was at my home, my house and she lived a little far away. She needed to take a bus. My dad and me took her to the bus station. She took a bus, blah, blah, blah. Everything was fine. And, and I think my dad realizes that I was a little too excited, you know? I didn't, I didn't realize that I was showing enough, you know, but... I think my dad realized it and then he started to go through, like, he got my phone when I wasn't around, started to go through it, and then he saw and he understood, like, he was understood before me kind of a thing, you know? And then it was just the big of a deal and he was like, you cannot talk with this girl anymore, uh, you cannot be friends with her, you cannot see her anymore, you just have to cut it off. It's not this that you're talking and feeling is not okay. So for me, it was like, like, what you mean? You know, like my best friend, the person that I most like to talk and that I more get connected with. I cannot talk to with this person anymore. Why? You know? So like, I think they, they see in a way that is dangerous, you know, they, I don't know, like for my dad, at least he decided to cut it off from the root. And for me, it was pretty painful. I remember, you know, like you didn't understand anything. Like, what am I doing wrong this time? Um, you know, and he didn't talk like it was not open conversation. It was just like, that's what it is. Accept it. Don't cry. And life moves, moves on, you know. So I just had to deal with that, like, okay, I guess, like, and little by little, forget about it. You know? That was harsh. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. For a girl, for like a young little girl that didn't get it, what was going on, it was pretty, pretty strong. In the Southern Baptists say no women clergy. The American Baptists, another group of Baptists in the U.S. say, okay, to have women clergy. What did your group of Baptists say about women as pastors? Uh, they don't, they don't allow it. Like sometimes the woman can say some stuff, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they open up for women, <laughs> but not as a leader. Like they don't see it that a woman can be a leader of a church, for example. Like the um, the wife of the pastor, she she kind of take care of the other women's, you know, like leader of the women's, but not a how do you call a pastor a woman that is a pastor? A clergy person or pastor clergy. minister? Yeah. But, but Baptists say pastor. Yeah, so they don't they don't open space for women to yeah. be a leader. Yeah. Right. Does that do, they, do they talk about humans are born sinful and flawed 
because of Eve's temptation of Adam. So women are somehow lesser and we're all inherently sinful. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. <laughs> How did that feel as a child to be to be told that you're you're a sinner? It's crazy because you don't get it. Like you when you're super young, you don't get it, but you start to believe it, you know? Like uh you start to believe that you need to to accept Jesus because you don't deserve anything if you were if it wasn't for Jesus dying for you. So it's kind of uh you have to do it. And if even if you don't feel anything or if you don't understand anything, you accept Jesus because you don't want to go to hell, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> no. Yeah. So you don't want to go to hell. So I remember for me. And it's kind of a brainwash thing because you're a kid. You 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 don't know what's going on, but your parent, the person that most care about you, and the pastor and everyone around you is telling you that you have to get baptized. Baptized. Yeah, baptized. And how much Jesus loves you and how good is Jesus. And then uh, we born humans and we're born sins already we're born dirty we're born like uh, we don't deserve anything like you're you're a, a worm like something that doesn't have any valor you know and these people were telling you that you should accept jesus and you should to get baptized and you don't think about to say no <laughs> you know like it's not an option because yeah. if you say no, or if you don't feel ready, you just don't say, you just don't tell them, look, I'm not ready. I don't know if I want to do that. You just do it because it's a tradition and everybody gets so excited that you accept Jesus finally, you know, now you're mature enough to accept Jesus. But that actually it's just, it's a lie that they believe it, you know, they believe it that they're ready to accept Jesus, but actually you're just being doing what the only option for you is to accept jesus i guess how so, old were you when you were baptized in the baptist church i was super young i think i was nine or ten that i got baptized so you do a little course you learn some stuff you accept it and then you get baptized and then your status on the church changes you know like now you're baptized now you're you're hundred percent going to heaven, <laughs> you know. What it, what happens if you sin after you're baptized? You still go to heaven. Um, you have to get. You have to assume kind of thing that you're you're the worst. You do that because you're you're weak. You know, you're pretty weak. So it was the devil that that tries you when you fall into it. So. Uh, we're here to honor Jesus and you want to get better for Jesus. So I'll do everything I can to fight against my, my, my essence, my dirty essence, you know, like I had to fight against that because I need to be pure because to Jesus to be proud of me, you know? And I remember like most of my friends, some friends on the church that I had, all the little group, the same age, everybody was doing, everybody was hiding something. Everybody that we knew between us. And sometimes we went out to do some wrong stuff together because everybody was, can you imagine, like a teenager, curious about everything, want to experiment, want to try, want to go out, want to leave and see and feel and then you cannot, you cannot. So sometimes my, some friends got caught doing some stuff and I got caught doing some stuff and it's the worst. They treat you like you're like a disease, you know, like they what treat you. What were you, you doing, may I ask? I was drinking a lot. Like <laughs> I used to go out, tell my dad that I was doing something that it was allowed 
go out to find some other friends, get drunk, super drunk, and then your dad got catch you, you know? Just teenager stuff, you know? You're just curious. And some other friends, they were like uh, getting an affair, kissing each other, and you cannot do it because you gotta be a virgin to get married, to Jesus get proud of you, and you know? So smoking weed, just these things, teenager things that teenagers do, you know? So for me, my dad caught me. He didn't caught, got me many times because I was pretty good pretending, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But he caught me. I, I remember I always asked him, Can I get a piercing? Can I get a piercing? Can I get a please dad? Can I get a piercing? No, no, no. We never talk about it anymore. So I did a piercing on a place that you can hide on the septum. Like you piercing and you put inside and nobody sees it, right? And it was my little secret. And then he and I used it. I put it the piercing now when I was out of home at the school, for example. And one time I was with my piercing out and my and I always come back home walking by myself and with my friends. And one time my dad my dad decided to pick me up at school and I was with the piercing out. And <laughs> like I look at my face my dad's face and I was like, fuck, that's gonna be a huge problem. You know, I already knew. So just my dad's energy and face, I was like, dude, like so always pretending, always hiding stuff because it was not allowed to be what you were. You had to be better to make Jesus happy. What were you allowed to go out on dates with boys? Never. Never. No. Only if this boy is from the church and Christian. But it was never my case to get interested about the boys from the the church. But another thing that happened to me, my dad caught me. I was uh, dating a guy from my school. I was, what, maybe 16, 17 already. And my dad, like, he somehow knew. And he went to the school. He freaked this little boy out. Oh. <laughs> He was like, never, never get around my daughter anymore. Don't talk with my daughter anymore. Be, be, be super, you know, like intimidated. And for me also when he, because come on, like 16, 17, for sure, gonna start to get interested about boys and like this way. And he just treated the situation and like it was pretty bad. And the other day at school, everybody was like, Adi, your dad was here. He was talking with Vinicius, like, wow, dude. You know, like, <laughs> it was a big of a deal. And, like, the, the boy was pretty scared. He was like, wow, I like you a lot, but you're <laughs> dead. And I was like, yeah, I know. I'm sorry about it. You know? So it was like a hunting thing to see what you're doing wrong. And then they're going to catch you. And then... You're going to go to church and ask for, so, like, pray to Jesus to forgive you because you were the worst, you know, like. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, it was pretty that's much That's a lot like to it. work through. Yeah, that's why Christian, like, not, I don't know, dude. It's just too much. Some some people adapt well. Like, I, have some, I know some people the same age as me. They were Christians just as me. And they adapt well. It was fine for them. And they follow the rules and it was fine, you know. And I also have some friends that their parents weren't Christians and they choose to be a Christian. And I was like, dude, but <laughs> how can you choose to be a Christian when you can be whatever you want, you know? But their perspective was were different because their parents were not forcing them to do something, you know. My, fam my dad was... I was obligated to follow those rules. And maybe that's why I get so against it because, because I couldn't be myself. And then I was just trying to escape all this reality. 
So you, your dad was the enforcer. What was the role of your mother? In- my mother, she also, like, when my parents got divorced, she didn't really come, like, she come back for the ch- for church a little sometimes, but she didn't follow through this way. You know, she still believes in, like, she still believes in Jesus Christ and she believes this and that, but she's pretty open. Like, uh, she's open for spirituality in general, but I think it's just a mindset thing. She she got it, the Christian is to say that she's a Christian because it's what she knows better. But she's not really a Christian person, you know? Like, she's she's open for other stuff. She understands better. She knows other possibilities. She's not just inside of this... But because you were living with your dad after you yeah. were eight, not your mom, he was he was the one who had the most control. Over yeah, you. he took control. Yeah, he took control. Like, also my mom, like now that I got older, I understand better. She wanted to be with me, you know, but my dad never allowed it. Like, uh, like you were you decide to divorce, you are leaving, you're not staying. And you're not staying with, with with our daughter. You, if you want to leave, you're gonna disappear. You have no rights to be around. So, so she left. <laughs> but she could have fought that legally, right? I mean, the mother has legal rights to see the child. Yeah, but I think at that point, it was just a mental, like, um, I think it was just so much control that she was going mad you know she have she have an um mental strength to keep fighting you know to keep fighting she was just like dude okay like i'll give up on this because i need to take care of my mental health and if i keep fighting about it i won't be able to like he was like looking now it was a case of like uh, she would kill herself, you know, if she stayed around for more, like, more. It was pretty heavy. And now I see better, right? And back then, I couldn't see the big picture, but now I understand better. Do you have any brothers and sisters? I'm the only one. Hmm. So you didn't have anybody to talk to talk in the bedroom? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And And then... Um, so they believe in, he, the, the pastor says that you should avoid alcohol, drugs, gambling, abortion, stem cell research, um, homosexuality, divorce, unless there's infidelity, pornography, cremation, (laughs) feminism. So that's, that sounds, it's all pretty much the same. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. hundred percent. Pretty heavy. And, And your dad is still a faithful Baptist churchgoer. He got better, I think. Like, the impression that I have when I talk to him is that he opened up a little bit. He's still pretty, you know? But at least now he can talk a little bit more about subjects, you know? I think when I was a kid, he didn't open up because he didn't want me to get a chance to start to think by myself you know so back there we didn't talk about stuff it's like it is what it is and i remember that some some stuff i keep insisting like uh why i cannot get a tattoo why i cannot do this and why and like i remember to ask often and he got just pissed off and it's like we're never gonna talk about this subject anymore never so just close the door and I could never ask anything, you know, because it was like a subject that was prohibited and, and at home. So now I think my dad's still pretty like this, but not like in the radical way. I think he got more mature during the time. And now he's more spiritual. He's not hmm. 100% religious just religious now i can um i can see some like he's still christian but 
more as a spiritual spiritual energy than a religion energy you know yeah interesting but does yeah. he still go to baptist church he i remember last time i talked to him the church that he was something really bad happened with the pastor i think they were fighting or something so the church got kind of split split up and my dad didn't agree with that so i think he changed it church but i think he's still going to a baptist one mm. but he changed the one that he used to go since forever did he ever get married again yeah so he got married again is a is a now it's a long time ago he took a little while to get married again but and were then you at he, home when he got married he got married i was at home but i was pretty much living so I think he got married, not really. I think he got married again when I was around 20, oh. 1920. So I got, I think, a year or something in contact living with them as a couple. And was she a Baptist? Yeah. That's <laughs> a curious thing because she's super cool. Like, she's the sweetest sweetheart. Oh. Oh, yeah, okay. she's and she's like uh that's just so funny like because she's a baptist but she's more as a spiritual christian than <laughs> religious christian uh, you know uh, so i remember she had like a friend that she used to help a lot she was lesbian you know but she was helping her people thought she was lesbian for being in contact with this woman but you know like she's uh way more open up so she's not as religious as and radical as my dad. She's more of a understanding person, loving person, helping person, you know, and not as much as a judge or a, I don't know, like a radical yeah. kind of. Yeah. What kind of work does your dad do? My dad is um. How do you call these people that work for the government? Civil servant. Yeah, civil servant. He used to be a civil servant for his entire life. So he does this kind of job. And he does, uh, like, beside that, he's an investor. So he does this, do those two things professionally. So he sits, he's a desk office worker. Yeah, he works for the um, for the company that how do you call this for water for the city? Yeah. Water yeah. district. Yeah. Water guy off sitting yeah. working on a computer, whatever. Yeah, got it. Um and then where did you go to college and did you live at home or did you go away to college? Yeah, so I went to college. I was I started college when I was sixteen oh. because it was a year in Brazil. It started at six, seventeen, I guess. But I started with sixteen because I'm from December. I born in December, so I got one year ahead. And I was at home when I was going to college. I never, never leave home when I was in Brazil. So, yeah. So did your dad not let you date when you were in college? My dad, like, if it was for him, I think he was pretty against it for me to get, like, in a relationship. I think he thought that I had other, like, on his mindset, I had other priorities in life instead of being in love, you know? Like, uh, for him, it was pretty much like, go to college, uh, invest in yourself. You don't need a boyfriend now, you know? And I remember that I, when I was 17, I started to get more in touch with my mom. And she was living around again, like, like not, very, not super around, but kind of. I knew where she was, and 
I start to see her more often. And she invited me to live with her. And I was around this age, 17. And I was like, yes, please, because I couldn't stand in my dad anymore. Too many plot, like a lot of problems, you know, like everything was a problem. Living inside of this box and want to do so much stuff, had to hide myself and, you know, like always pretending everything's fine. So I was like, yes, I'm going to live with you. So I started to live with her when I was around 17 again. And then I started to, I had my first boyfriend. And I was living with my mom. And then I had, like, freedom, you know, to go on dates, to bring my boyfriend home, you know, to be real. Like, I'm this person. And, uh, you know, like, I felt it was, like, one of the the first times that I started to go out. And I didn't need to, to lie about it, you know. Like, yeah, I'm out and I'm with those friends in some place. And everything was fine, you know. I didn't need to hide anymore. So I started to have a boyfriend at this age. And I'm assuming that you did not go to Baptist church when you lived with your mom. No. <laughs> it was freedom. Really? Sometimes my dad like wanted me to go. And I some Sundays I used to go with him. But not all Sundays and Fridays. I, not at the same as it was. <laughs> So uh, what did you study in university? What did you major in? So I studied, they call in Portuguese, they call letras, but it's like a course about language. Like, like in Brazil, I could be a Portuguese teacher. And I had English a little bit in school also, in university, but not enough to learn, just grammar and stuff. But I could be like um I can be other stuff also. I can I can work like um editing stuff, I can work for um publishing books, translation, uh grammar reveal, like you can be a teacher, you can be a lot of stuff inside of this universe of languages. Got it. Um so after university, did you work or did you decide to go visit the U.S.? Yeah, so after university, I worked just enough to make money to get out of there. <laughs> so I've been working maybe for, like, while I was in university, I used to, I don't know how to call that in English, when you can work in some places because you're studying something so i used to work on the library the public library and i would call it an internship yeah it could be yeah like you can work there because you are in college when you're out of college you, you cannot work there anymore so yeah, I, internship internship so i used to do that for a few years while i was studying university and but the salary is very little very very little so i got like kind of lucky because i didn't really need to help at home and all the money that i was making i could save to to do like for my purpose right so i've been saving in brazil like it's a big of a deal to make money enough to to buy a ticket or you know to a uh, airplane ticket is super expensive so I was saving for maybe four years to be able to afford the the travel and then I did a little bit of everything like I used to work in a coffee shop a shopping mall everything I could to make some cash and then when I I had the cash, not at all, but I started to research what I want to do. And then I decided to, okay, I got the cheapest thing that I can afford just to leave. <laughs> and then I did it. And why did you pick California to explore? Well, when I got here first, I got in Boston uh -huh. because, yeah, I did an outpair thing. The family that I matched with, they were in Boston. 
So I stayed in Boston for a year and a half, trying to adapt. <laughs> because like on my mind, I was like, okay, I'm the outsider, right? So I need to adapt. And I thought that I would adapt and if I stay there. But then after a year and a half, I was like, probably I won't adapt to here. <laughs> so I just decided to leave. And I didn't have a plan. I I met a friend, another friend that was there in Boston. Pretty open also. We're like, dude, let's just do like, let's just get out of here. Let's do a road trip or something. And then I sell everything I had. And I got the car and started to drive. <laughs> and then we spent like six months, I guess, on the road. We got to California. The plan was to keep traveling, I guess. We didn't have a plan. We we're just going with the flow. And then my friend decided that he needed to come back to Brazil because he had a son and her his visa was expiring. He decided to to come back and I was in California. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll stay around to make some money, start to work a little bit, start to find people, to meet people. And then I start to just stay in California because it's a super different culture, right? Like East Coast and West Coast is kind of two different universes. Mm. Coast, like culture, weather, everything is so different. Mm. It's but, more formal, more European there in the East Coast? Yeah, East Coast, I my theory is because of I think the weather is colder, people were colder, culture is colder, you know, it's not just like uh, it's harder to get into a person and feel like, okay, now we're friends. It's a super slow process for you to get to know someone for real, you know, it doesn't open up. I remember that I had some friends, but all my friends that I had there, or they were Brazilians or were they were from somewhere else that are not from here. But yeah, I just didn't really connect it there. So how would you explain your spiritual views now? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in karma, reincarnation, nothing? What, what yeah. where are you now? So now I do believe. We call God, right? But it could be like a consciousness or um, spirit or a force, something. For sure, for me, right? I feel like there is something out there, like creation or there is something. I don't know. We could go call God, but I don't have a religion that explains that. For me, it's kind of a mystery that you're going to, try to chase, look for answers, but it's just, it is what it is, you know, like I can try to understand and I can try to feel and I can try to, to, I don't know, to get more in contact with that, but I, I don't know. I believe in something, but I don't have a religion. Is that numb, no? Yeah. No, they call it nuns, N O N E S. It has no. a word for it. Yeah. So, so they people who are who have no religion, they call them nuns. The, yeah. the scholars. Um, how do you deal with years of ingrained guilt, shame, sin, hiding yourself? I mean, that, that those all your formative years, there was a cloud over you. So mm -hmm. how, where are you now in terms of, I, I can't imagine that it's still not having an effect. Yeah, it's just like, for me, it's a journey of knowing myself. Now, after all this, like I left home when I was 22 and now I'm 29. And for me, it was a journey of learning what I am for me. You know, that is not wrong to be this or not wrong to go to that place that you want to. It's not wrong. Have all these things you think, it's okay too. But I feel like that, that just marked me so much because even now when I know that I can do whatever I want, sometimes there's still a little voice in there, you know, this little root that say like, now, now I am getting better, but before I was like, just this shadow, like, maybe you're going to hell, 
Então... <risos> <laughs> Maybe that's not the right thing. And now I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm getting more free of this. It's just a subconscious thing that you think you're not Christian, but when you realize that you have this Christian rule installing you, you know, that is just like, do this. Even when I don't want, even when I hate it, is. It's still there, something, you know, because that's how I was taught. Or that is wrong to be like that. It's not right to be like that. So trying to adapt to be something that is more accepted, you know. So now I, I feel like it's a work in progress to get, like, free of those ideas. And I feel like I'm getting better, for sure, but... But it's just a huge process to clean it out, you know. If you someday have children, how would you teach them about the bigger issues or morality or what happens after death or those big questions? Yeah, I think like um, for kids, I don't want like for sure there's some stuff like your value values or values. Virtu values like social social dynamics and stuff like I think this can be taught doesn't involve and doesn't need to involve religion for this like uh, as a human you're able to think about yourself and you're able to discern like what is how we can treat someone and how do you want to be treated and how you can respect it to each other. Like, you have no control of other people. You have control by yourself. <laughs> like, you can know what you think and you can know what is right for you, How what you feel good and what you feel bad about it. That's probably, if you feel bad about doing something, probably it's not a good thing. Or if you, you know, like... I never really thought about how to teach a kid for life. Um, but I don't really think you need a religion to to tell you what is right or wrong. You have discernment to um to think about yourself and like to to process information with your own heart and intuition or values or you know. And I think as a human species, we know moral morally, like we, we have moral to discern when you're doing a bad thing to someone. I think it's part of our nature. Mm -hmm. When you're doing something wrong, you kind of know that. But it's, we cannot generalize it, right? Because there's people that do a lot of stuff wrong. I don't know. But I think we have some some stuff inside ourselves a that, moral compass yeah yeah then that kind of guide us you know between. they they talk about motor neurons that we have you heard that we have we have neurons that you're feeling a certain way they trigger my neurons and i feel how you're feeling so oh, yeah. there, there's a physiological connection that we have with people so yeah. if i'm feeling oh she's sad and hurt then that's a signal to me, don't do what makes her feel sad and hurt. Exactly. We You have this condition, right? So a kid, like, it's so interesting to see. There are some uh, experiments. They, they're they testing kids about when they, when they have no parents, no anyone to say anything. And someone lose a candy, you know, drop a candy. And this kid doesn't have no one to say, give it back. Or, like, it doesn't have no one to say, to tell them. But they do the thing. They know it. Like, hey, you let it drop. It's yours. It's not mine. They know it, you know? So, like, instant, our instinct is to be good as a kid when you don't know. You're, you, you have this thing that you, you know that already. I think we just start to be... 
like to do in a different way when you start to get older and realize how how we can be on the other side also I don't know yeah um you're a young generation Y a millennial and then and there's it's similar in a lot of ways I think to generation Z that's in their 20s and upper teens and sometimes I think well, I have hope because Y and Z are more liberal, accepting of diversity. They don't care what your skin color is. Um, so I, I wonder if you think there is hope that Y and Z will make the world better because right now the world is in a terrible mess of growing inequality, destroying the environment, wars all over the place. So I, my question is, do you think there's grounds for hope with youth or not? Uh, I want to be positive and believe so. <laughs> but like, um, like looking on my environment, right? Like looking my friends and the people surround, that surrounds me, they, they are pretty liberal and open and they they don't care about their color, about their religion. But looking like from other environments and other realities of same generation, but other kind of growth, other like other kind of, of environments, there's a lot of different ideas also, you know? But I believe that we're getting better as humanity on this point. You know, like people are like, even on churches, they're getting better, you know, like um, it's not like that anymore in a lot of churches. They're more open. They're like uh, more options. If you want to be a Christian, you can, you don't need to be inside of this box. You can still be a Christian. A little bit not as paranoid, you know, like you think so that's I, true even for Baptists? Um, I think there's now in Brazil at least there's so many kinds of there's like inside of Christian there's Baptist, this, this and that. But inside of the Baptist there are many kinds of Baptists, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So there's the traditional and pretty conservative ones, but there's others I don't know if you can call it a Baptist. I don't know. It's just so many layers of the same thing. But like uh, I've been also like I know some Christians that they're really good people, you know, like they're nice people. <laughs> so this kind of Christians also give me some hope. But speaking in general as humanity and generations, we have potential to be better because we're not as like we have more tools to do not be as controlled as we were before. We have more information. We have more technology. We have more, you know, so if you really want to know something, you just look through for it and then that helps a lot, you know, because you mm -hmm. don't need to ask anyone to have an answer. You can just look for an answer yourself. So if you really want to, if you have some questions and you really want to to construct a way of thinking, you don't need the pastors telling you. You you can realize that maybe the pastor doesn't know anything and it's better to do not listen to this person because you don't have to, you know. I think... <laughs> It's, yeah. it's interesting to me that um, evangelicals who stress morality support Trump and in Brazil, Bolsonaro. Yeah, and a Bolsonaro. lot of Christians. It's just He so depended on evangelicals. Yeah, no, it's so contradictory. It's so contradictory that you're like, you you don't even have arguments. To, you, you don't want to convince these people because they con they con contradict themselves on what they're saying you no know, like okay you have to love you have to not love the other but your president the guy that he supports is just 
hate these people and want to kill everyone, you know? Like, so it's just like, dude, I think it's a lot of hate, hate, uh, just far said as love, you know? Mm. So it's, for me, reality is just ups, upside down. Mm. What they say is right is actually wrong, and what they say is wrong is actually right. Mm. And it's just like uh, this crazy thing that we see that doesn't make any sense. But the positive thing is Brazil voted Bolsonaro out and he ended up in Florida. Yeah. It's, you know, Trump could get elected. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I think go Brazil. <laughs> go Brazil. Yeah, totally. Brazil realized it because it was just, it was a, uh, crazy crazy times with this dude in, in power you know and a lot of people that voted for him understood that they fuck it up and like okay i won't do that again but there's some people that is still like uh pretty fanatic like uh about Bolsonaro. there's people that really love this guy and it's a lot of christians that really support this guy so for me it's just like um I don't know. It doesn't make any any sense. What 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 really got me about <clears throat> Bolsonaro is he has, I think, four sons and a daughter, and he said his daughter was conceived in a moment of his weakness. <laughs> Can you <laughs> He's believe that it? Kind of like failure in his masculinity. Yeah, yeah. That you're saying <laughs> that about your own daughter. That is pretty crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like and, and these people say that they like women. I think these people are mostly gay. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> they admire men so much that they just don't don't <laughs> you know, like they admire a man so much and they don't give space for women for nothing. They just have sex with women. The only thing that they admire the they, they do with women is having sex, but all the the rest they they reject, you know, so like that's why they hate for me my theory that's why they hate homosexuals so much because that's pretty much what they want to be but they don't have the courage to be you know mm. and that's the evangelicals you're talking about who don't spend t time with women uh yeah evangelical and christian in in general well, when we say Christian, they could be Catholic, they could be Protestant, yeah. they could be Mormon. They could. There's so many different. Yeah, yeah, true. Evangelical. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, anything else that uh, we we would like people to know about what's happening with you or with religion in Brazil? Or yeah, well, I don't know. Like with me, uh. All good. I think uh, I'm making peace with the Christian scenario and like Baptist thing. I used to hate it then, like to hate like hardcore. Like I used to doesn't, I used to don't like Christian because for me it was just like a matter of like, you don't want to think by yourself. You need someone to, to like you, you don't want to have the power to guide your life. You know, like you want someone to tell you what to do and then you just follow. You don't want to think about yourself. So I started to reject uh, Christianity and religion pretty much. I was like, dude, I don't get it. But now good thing is that I'm making peace with this. I don't really hate Christians anymore. Sometimes I'm like, dude, think of think a little bit about it, wonder, question a little bit, you know? But I also understand that it's people that need religion to have some control of themselves. Because, mm. like my dad, for example, my dad before that, he was a pretty, like, he have all, always been a pretty violent guy, alcoholic guy, and because of the church and Christ, he got some control. Oh, interesting. You know? Because of this, then now you have uh, God to make happy. He didn't drink anymore. He never touched alcohol anymore. Mm. So there are some people that they need that to get control of their lives. If it's not for themselves, because they love themselves and their family, but if for God they do it, you know? So there are some people that need that, and I get it. 
But yeah, I'm trying making peace little by little with that. In Brazil, there's all the kinds of Christians, and there's these hardcore people that they they say they are Christian, but it's all the opposite. There's nice Christians. There are a lot of religions in Brazil, actually, because it's like so many colonization in Brazil and people from all over the world there. So Brazil is a pretty, well, statistic is pretty Christian. But it's open for other religions also. So, yeah, I think that's it for me. <laughs> great, great, great. Uh, I'm going to stop recording.